All right, hello guys, welcome back to another one. Uh, today we're ready to cover World War I. We finally made it to a big war. It's very exciting, it's a big point in history. Uh, we're on US standards 23 to 25, so we're rocking and rolling. Um, this PowerPoint will be on my website per usual. Um, I would recommend uh, looking at this one on your own because there's some great pictures in this one. We're getting to a time period and an era in history when photography starts to play a really important role. Um, and it's very good for us as students of history because we can get to look at these pictures and get to see real actual evidence of all this stuff that happened. Um, so we got some big standards to cover. We got to talk about why World War I happened. Um, it's pretty complicated, but we're going to break it down in a way that I hope you'll understand. And we'll use an acronym, acronym that I hope you'll remember. Um, I'll go ahead and show you the acronym. It is this. Here, I'll write right here. M-A-N-I-A, -A, mania, okay? And we're gonna go through and I'll tell you what all of these letters stand for. Um, but if you remember the acronym mania, and sometimes some people leave out one of the A's and put it in its own category, and they just use this one for main. Um, but I like this one because it gets them all in, and I'll explain what that means later, okay? Um, then we're going to talk about why the U.S. got in the war. Uh, world War I is from 1914 to 1918, but the U.S. doesn't actually get involved until 1917, okay? So the U.S. is actually only involved in the war for about a year, um, and they play a very, very, very important role. They actually are basically the winners of the war. They help the Allies. There's two sides in the war, and one side is the Allies. They help the Allies win the war, um, and uh, then we'll talk about how World War I is different than all the other wars that have come before. And there's mainly one real reason why, and it's this right here, new weapons and technology. World War I is a transition war. Uh, it's in Europe, and the guys in Europe, they tried to fight a medieval-style war where it's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand type stuff and a lot of really close com uh, combat, but the problem is now they have machine guns. So World War I is going to be a big-time bloodbath. A lot of people got killed in World War I. Um, it's something like 10 million people died during World War I just in combat. We're not even talking about all the disease and stuff that goes with war. There's always a lot of disease with war. It's because people are just so close together and living in fields and things like that. Um, but it's a war where they use old-style tactics of trying to attack each other face-to-face -face, um, with new weapons like airplanes, tanks, poison gas, machine guns, all that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very interesting time period. I hope you're excited. I know I am. I'm glad we finally made it. Remember to pause anytime you need to. Remember to email me with any questions. And definitely, I would highly recommend going to my webpage and taking a look at this PowerPoint today. It'll be linked on there, okay? Because um, this is a good one. All right? Ready, ready, ready? Let me take a look and make sure the screen is looking good. Make sure we can see. Rocking and rolling. And so let's do this thing. Here we go. So first things first, we are going to discuss the causes of World War I. Um, and I told you there's an acronym that you need to remember, and I'm going to write it again. And it is uh, MANIA. M-A-N-I-A. And what this stands for, it stands for militarism. And I'll explain what all these letters mean in detail. Militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and then the last A is a little bit different. It stands for assassination, okay? So these four can kind of be put in their own category because they're all ideas, okay? So these are all ideas. And sometimes people put it like this, M-A-I-N, militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, and they leave out the assassination. And I kind of get that because these are the ideas, the concepts, but I like to put it all together because this last A, assassination, is gonna be really the tipping point that makes this whole thing get started. Um, so remember mania or main, whatever you want to remember, um, but I'm going to go ahead and explain what these letters actually mean, and then we'll put it all together, and it'll make more sense once you understand what they mean, okay? So the cause of the World War I, and then why the U.S. is neutral. Neutral means the U.S. does not pick a side at first. They actually really do technically pick a side, but they don't get involved for quite some time, and I'll explain what that, how that goes here in just a little while, okay? All right. So first things first, the first M in mania, or main, whatever you want to do. I'm going to stick with mania just because that's the one I like. Plus the word mania is cooler than uh, main. Yeah. All right, so um, the M, militarism, okay? Militarism just means 
that powerful countries around the world, so we're talking England, France, Russia, Germany, Italy, and there's a country that you need to know, it's called Austria-Hungary, and I'll explain that one later. Uh, these very, very powerful countries are building up their militaries during the early 1900s, okay? If you recall, the time period of industrialization, the Gilded Age, right? The Gilded Age was really, really good for the United States because the United States had a lot of money. Now, here's what we didn't really talk about, though, is that this money gets spread kind of around the world because global trade now becomes a thing, okay? Uh, because these countries, they're all expanding, they're all creating things, and they're all making lots of money. And one of the things that they do realize is that they need to protect their money and protect their interests. They are worried about increased competition, so they need protection. And the very best way to protect your country, even nowadays, is to build up a strong military. So the idea of militarism just means building up a strong military, okay? Now here's the problem with this. When you build up a very strong military, your neighboring countries are going to look at you and they're going to say, hmm, that group over there, there, that country over there, they're starting to build up their military. They've got lots of guns and things. Maybe we need to start stockpiling guns and maybe we need to hire more service members. Maybe we need to enlist more people in our military too. So you get all these different countries and they're starting to build up and it's like their muscles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. And eventually, these two sides, they're going to see, hey, your military looks bigger than mine. This might be a good opportunity for me to come in and attack, you know, because you never know. So this is a way of building up a tense situation. And that's kind of what we're headed towards in Europe is a very tense situation, okay? Because these militaries are getting bigger. They're all wanting to protect their money and they're all getting more money because they're all trading now. We got a global trade network and things are starting to build in Europe. We got a tense situation building in Europe, okay? So keep that in mind. So mania, again, just going back to this, it's gonna be a theme that I hit throughout. Mania, the first M is militarism. So building up the militaries, okay? All right, the A, the first A, there are two A's, but the first A in mania, and I'm gonna write it again. You're gonna get sick of this, I don't care. It's good for you to remember. The first A in mania stands for alliances, okay? So the alliances in Europe at the time, it's countries that naturally trade with each other, countries that tend to be similar, countries that uh, are, you could just call them friends, okay, so to say. So alliances is just a fancy word for friends, all right? Now, during World War I, there are two sides against each other. The first side, it has two names, we're going to use the word allies because this word is triple entente. It's French. Um, but I like to use the word allies because this is going to get confusing because there's also the triple alliance. We're going to call it the allies versus the central powers. Okay? Allies versus central powers. All right? So the allies in World War I are France, Russia, and Great Britain. Okay? And then the central powers of the Triple Alliance, see, see, see how that can get confusing. The central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. So it's these groups, this group of people, these groups, this country, versus these guys, okay? Now, I know that's a little bit confusing. Who you really need to remember in this situation, and I'm gonna have to erase something here, whoops. Who you really need to remember on this side, the Allies, that's mainly going to be Great Britain or England, okay, and France, Great Britain and France, and the USA is going to join on this side too, okay, later, versus the main one that you need to know is Germany. Germany is the big player in this side, and I hate to kind of be this way because, you know, you're not supposed to pick sides in history or whatever. But I consider this, these are the good guys, the allies, and I only say that because we were involved on that side, so that automatically makes us the good guys, right? So the allies are the good guys, the central powers are the bad guys, and for that, we're gonna say Germany is the bad guy, okay? Now, we'll understand why Germany becomes the bad guy, especially leading up into World War II. Um, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but World War II is directly caused by World War I, and we'll talk about that when we get to World War II, okay? But just know, that all these countries in Europe are starting to choose sides. 
And here's the thing about choosing sides and having friends. When one of your friends gets in a fight, so let's say you're walking down the hall and you're walking with your best friend or maybe two or three of your friends and somebody walks up to one of your friends and starts arguing with them, punches them in the face or something, as a friend of your friend, you, you have an obligation to jump in and try to help out your friend. You know, either step in and say, yo, 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 you gotta chill out or just to pop them one back. Now, I'm not condoning violence, especially not at school. Don't do it at school, okay? Don't do it anywhere. But, you know, you're always supposed to take care of your friends. And that's the problem with this, with World War I, with this acronym of MANIA. Because with these alliances, okay, with these alliances, these alliances also have big militaries already, okay? So these alliances, this one, they are backed up with their militaries. And guess what? They're itching for a fight because when you've got a brand new military, big brand new military with all these guns and everything, and now your friends are getting involved in a fight, things are going to get weird, okay? Now, we're not ready for the fight yet, but we're almost there, all right? So, militarism is the first one. Alliances is the second one. So, these are the five causes of World War I, okay? And we've got two of them now, militarism and alliances, all right? So, let's take a look at the third one. The third one stands for nationalism. Nationalism, okay? So I'm gonna write it down one more time. I told you you're gonna get sick of it. The third one that we're on is nationalism. The N is for nationalism. And what that means, it's just extreme pride in one's country. Extreme patriotism. There's nothing wrong with nationalism whatsoever. In fact, you should be proud of where you come from, where, where your homeland is. Now here's the issue though. When you're extremely proud where you come from, if someone insults you, or if you even feel insulted, whether they not insult they, whether or not they insult you on purpose, uh, you're going to be willing to jump in to fight. So this situation, this tense situation, remember I explained there was a tense situation building in Europe, it is magnified because a lot of these countries, uh, they, they talked really greatly about themselves. They say, hey, England is the best country, and Germany, you're crap. And then Germany's saying the opposite. They're saying, Germany is the best country. England, you're garbage. We hate you, blah, blah, blah. So all these countries are starting to talk bad about each other, and they call that nationalism, saying that they're better than everyone else. And, you know, you never want to be around someone who says they're better than anybody else. It's always very, very annoying, okay? So um, this tense situation is starting to build and build and build, okay? And nationalism is a big part of this, and what that means it's extremely, it's being extremely proud of where you came from, your homeland. And what the problem with that is, is it makes it very easy to get insulted if somebody does something or says something that you get offended by, okay? So nationalism just means extreme pride in one's country and it, it adds more to this tense situation that's building in Europe, okay? All right, so we've got militarism, building up militaries, alliances, countries being friends, and now we've got nationalism, and that's having extreme pride in your country, okay? And that can lead to a fight, all right? All right, moving on. The next one, imperialism. And you learned about this one in the last lesson. And hey, guess what? I'm gonna write it again. Yay! <laughs> Remember, repetition is the key to memory. Now we are ready for the I. The I stands for imperialism. And what imperialism means is when one country starts to take over other countries. And you can see, remember, let me go ahead and write this again, a tense situation in Europe is building, and if countries are starting to take over other countries or to compete with other countries for, here's a big word that we always have to discuss, for land, okay, or resources, or money, or political power, or economic power. Basically, any type of competition, which building an empire leads to in competition, leads to a lot of competition. And guess what? You've gotta have a strong military to keep your empire safe. This situation is just going to get more and more and more tense. So these European countries, such as Germany, and France, and England, and Russia, they're all building, they're all expanding, and they're all becoming more global. But the problem is they're gonna start getting in each other's way. And when they get in each other's way, they're gonna start bumping heads. And when you bump heads, it can turn into a fight. And the fight just happens to be World War I that we're heading towards, okay? So we've got four out of five. So let's get into the, we're gonna go ahead and go over them one more time. So M stands for militarism, building up strong militaries. 
A stands for alliances. It's groups of countries who are being very close friends. And remember, when one of your friends gets in a fight, guess what you have to do? You got to get in the fight too. Nationalism means having extreme pride in your country. And so when you have extreme pride, you're likely to get your feelings hurt when somebody does something that you see as bad, okay? And then imperialism is the next one. That's when other countries are starting to take over other places. They're kind of running into each other around the world. And that's when they're really going to start to butt heads. And then we're ready for the last A. And I'll explain what that one is right now. Remember to pause if you need to, email me if you need to, read the notes, that sort of thing. It's all on my website. And the last one is this one. Okay, assassination. So the last A stands for assassination. So I'm gonna write it down one more time. M-A-N-I-A, -A. okay? So the last A is this one, assassination. So here's the deal. One of the countries that was involved, that was France with Germany. Remember, I told you, you, may, you need to remember Germany, okay? Please remember Germany. There's a country that is friends with Germany, and it's called Austria-Hungary, okay? So you got Germany and Austria-Hungary that are friends, okay? Remember that. Now, there was a group of Serbian terrorists. Now, I haven't told you anything about Serbia yet, so don't worry about it. But these terrorists, they belong to a group called the Black Hand. It's a terrorist group, okay? And what they want is a united Eastern European Empire. Eastern European Empire, okay? And these are, these are countries that are in Eastern Europe. They're all really small. They're like Serbia, Yugoslavia, um, which I don't even know if that was the name of the country then. Yugoslavia's had like 10 different names where the Czech Republic is. It's all these Eastern European countries, okay? And what they want is to create a united Eastern European empire, all right? So this group, the Serbian terrorists, the Serbs, they have a plan. This country, Austria-Hungary, does not want them. They say, we don't want this Eastern European Empire. We want to have control over all these people. So Austria-Hungary is an enemy to the Serbians, okay? And remember, the Serbians want an Eastern European Empire. I know this is extremely confusing. Just follow me. It'll all make sense here soon, okay? So one day, and I'm going to go ahead and show you some pictures. One day, this guy who is, his name is Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand, okay, which is an awesome name. Franz Ferdinand, he is the Austria, he is, he's going to be the next king of Austria-Hungary once the current king died, okay? So he's heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. That's this guy, okay? He is friends, you need to remember this, he is friends with Germany. All right, so a lot of people think World War I is really confusing, and that's because of this story right here. The story is confusing, okay? So he's friends with Germany. He is from Austria-Hungary, okay? This is him too. This is Franz Ferdinand. This is Franz Ferdinand getting shot, okay, because he's gonna get shot. That's the A, the last A. All right, and let me explain who this guy is, this little punk over here. He is a punk, because he does something very punky. He kills him, okay? He is from Serbia. Remember, what did I tell you the Serbians want? They want a united Eastern European Empire. This guy doesn't want that. He wants to maintain power. They want independence too. Serbia wants independence. He wants independence from Austria-Hungary, and this guy's not gonna give it to him, okay? This is a political scheme that's going on. They were not gonna give independence to Serbia, okay? So this young man is a terrorist. So I'll put it, he's a terrorist. His name is Gavrilo Princip. You don't really need to know that. You just need to know that he's a terrorist from Serbia. And this is him right here. This is the same guy right here. Okay, same guy. He shot the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It's the same guy. Okay, and this is the assassination. The assassination is what you need to remember. Actually, this is kind of cool. This is from the day that he got killed. That's kind of crazy. We have a picture of him on his last day. Ooh, it's kind of scary too. Okay, so. Here is the last A in mania. It stands for assassination. I'm gonna write it in red. Bah, bah, bah. All right, 
So this Serbian guy who wants independence from Austria-Hungary shoots Franz Ferdinand. He shoots him in the head, okay, or in the chest. I don't know, he shot him. All right, and uh, this makes everybody in Europe freak out, all right? Especially a country who is friends with Austria-Hungary called Germany. Germany gets really mad about this, and they declare war on Serbia, okay? So this is where, this is where everybody gets real confused, because obviously it's a complicated story, it's complex. Serbia wants independence, he says no, so this terrorist shoots him, okay? That's the assassination, all right? And so Germany declares war on Serbia. Remember, I told you, it's all about weird, complicated friendships. And Serbia's friends with Russia. And guess what? Because Germany has declared war on Serbia, Ser uh, Serbia's good friend Russia now declares war on Germany. So you see how it gets really, really complicated? Woo! Man, oh man, okay? I've written down a, a diagram over here. I'm gonna move the camera and I want you to show it. I wanna show it to you. Let's see. Oh, this is like a vlog today. It's a little bit different. All right, so I've kind of broken it down over here so you can kind of see it again. Hopefully I'm not talking too loud in the video. But you can see that Franz Ferdinand, he's friends with Germany, right? And this terrorist group, the Black Hand, that he's a member of, okay? They don't like it. They want a united Eastern European Empire. And Franz Ferdinand, this guy, he says no. He's from Austria-Hungary, who is friends with Germany, okay? This is a fancy video this time. And they are the Serbians. This guy, they're supported by Russia. And look, it winds it all up at the end. By August 1914, look what happens. Russia and Germany declare war, okay? And all these alliances, this group up here, they have to jump in too because they're all friends. So if you notice, Russia versus Germany and all these other groups, they've got to jump in too. Hey, cool, we mixed it up this time, a little less boring. By the way, here's my classroom in case you've ever wondered what's behind. Got a lot of flags. Woo! I didn't ride my bike today. Normally it's parked over there. I drove. All right, so very complicated, I know, but hopefully you understand at least a little bit of it. Now the camera's not wanting to stand up. All right, I think we're good. Hopefully it doesn't fall. All right. So the last A in mania stands for assassination. And you can see how this kicks off the war because all these people start declaring war on each other. Germany, who is friends with them, declares war on Serbia. Then Serbia's like, uh-uh-uh. Or excuse me, Russia's like, uh-uh-uh. You can't declare war on Serbia. We're gonna declare war on you back. And so now the thing has gotten kick-started. And this is kind of the spark that lights the fire, okay? So it was, you know, it was like a smoldering ember, the militarism, the alliances, the nationalism, the imperialism, and then this really <laughs> makes it like a powder keg and it blows up. All right? All right. Now, we have to talk about America because this is American history, okay? But remember, I told you, uh, the United States doesn't get involved for a long, long time, and here's why. Woodrow Wilson, who was president at the time, likes the idea of isolationism. Isolation means you stay alone by yourself, okay? So you don't get involved. And this is the reason why. They, they wanted to stick to this policy right here. No foreign entanglements. Now, Woodrow Wilson's doing something pretty smart here. He wants to stay neutral because he is hearkening back, he is, he is going back to a guy, a fancy guy from the very beginning of American history, George Washington. This was Washington's idea. When Washington retired from the presidency, when he said, I don't want to be president anymore, because remember, they wanted him to be president forever. When Washington retired from the presidency, he wrote down this very important farewell address, okay? And in the farewell address, he says, America, you need to avoid entangling foreign alliances. You need to not get yourself in a bunch of complicated friendships because your complicated friendships will get you straight into a war, just like what's happening in Europe. So Woodrow Wilson looks at the situation in Europe and he's like, you know what? What would the founding fathers do? What would George Washington do in this situation? And he says, Washington, in his farewell address, in his last speech, says stay out of foreign alliances because they're going to get you all tangled up into a situation you don't want to get involved in, aka a war, 
and he's right. But here's the thing. Wilson says this, but the whole time during the beginning of the war from 1914 to 1917, we're actually helping out the Allies the entire time. And I'll explain why later, okay? Let me make sure this looks okay since I've put it back and it's looking good. Oh, it looks great. Perfect. And we're only 25 minutes in. That's pretty good. And I already knocked out one of them. So hopefully all that makes sense. Uh, we're going to go over the review questions right now. Remember to pause. Email me if you have any questions. That's the thing about this class is it's going to get slightly more complicated with each lesson because it all builds, okay? So what are the five causes of World War I? And I remember... You can use this acronym, N-A-N-I-A, -N okay? And what that means, first one, is militarism, which means building up the military, building up your military, okay? I'm not gonna write all that down, I'm not gonna define them, because we already did. So militarism, alliances, all those complicated friendships that will get you in a war, okay? Nationalism, meaning having extreme pride to the point of you get really offended if somebody does something to your country, okay? The I stands for imperialism, countries taking over each other, which you can see how that would be a problem. And the A, the last A, and I'm going to run out of space, assassination. Assassination means murdering someone who is a high-profile target, such as the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Hopefully you can see it. Okay, let me make sure and see what that looks like. Might have to rewrite it. Yeah, let me rewrite assassination. All for y'all. <laughs> By the way, I hope y'all are having a good day. Y'all have done great so far. And let's just keep it going, okay? So militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and assassination. So those are the five causes. Remember the acronym MANIA, and again, like I told you, some people leave off the last A because they put it in its own category. I put it right in there because that's definitely uh, what I see as the kickstart to the war. Because right after that, Germany declares war on Serbia because they're like, hey, you messed with our friend Austria-Hungary. And then Russia says, wait, 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 you're going to declare war on Serbia, Germany? Well, guess what? We, Russia, are going to declare war on you, Germany, now. So now you see all these countries, but it, it snowballs, okay? All right. So number two, that leads right in there. The Allies, which countries make up the Allies? That is Great Britain, aka England, same country, okay? Great Britain, France, and Russia. And I want you to go ahead and know this too. Later, the USA, USA joins on this side later. And that's why I call these the good guys, okay? And then the bad guys, the central powers. That is Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Italy. So Germany, I told you to remember the main one, Germany. Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. That was where Franz Ferdinand was from. And remember, Franz Ferdinand didn't want to give independence to Serbia, and therefore that guy shot Franz Ferdinand, okay? I know this has all been very, very complicated because these are all new vocabulary words and new ideas. Um, but I think once we get into the war, which we're into the war now, hopefully it'll all make sense. So all of these things, the first four, they led to a very tense situation. And then the assassination, the last A, the assassination, that's what kicks the war off, gets it going there. Okay, let me get out of the way, make sure you can see. Make sure to pause if you need to. And rock and roll. Ooh, this floor feels good on my bare feet. Woo! Uh, all right, number three. What event, and it's the last A in Mania, what event was the tipping point that caused World War I? That's going to be the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Okay. Remember, he's the leader of Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary doesn't want to give Serbia their independence. So that's why Serbia, that Serbian terrorist, killed him. And then because of that, all these countries declare war on each other. And then why did Woodrow Wilson want to maintain neutrality during World War I? Neutrality means you're not picking a side. Being neutral, you don't pick a side. And he wants to avoid 
entangling foreign alliances. In other words, getting involved in a friendship that's going to get you in a war. To evolve, avoid entangling foreign alliances. Which basically means, I'm just going to put it over here too, avoid a war. All right. Let me see how that looks. Let me see how we're doing on time. We're doing good. 30 minutes in. That's very good. I, yeah, you can see that fine. All right. Pause if you need to. Go over all the slides again if you need to. Um, and we're going to talk about now, why does the U.S. get involved? Okay, because the U.S. is going to have to get involved. They, don't, they end up not having a choice. Germany messes around and does some bad stuff. And it's going to get ugly pretty quick. Okay. So now you know the, the five causes of World War I. Now you know what's going on. Now you know how it got started. So let's talk about why America gets involved. And I'm going to give you a hint. It's very, 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 it's super easy, actually. Basically, Germany gets wild with their submarines, and they start bl uh, blowing up American ships. Um, I'll tell you why, though. It's not, Germany wasn't totally evil in this situation. They were, but America was messing around, too. I'll explain why later. And then the Zimmerman telegram, this is when Germany kind of has a brain fart and does something real stupid. They wrote a letter, that, and I'll just go ahead and explain it. The Zimmerman telegram, it's a letter from Germany to Mexico that asks Mexico to attack the United States. Because they, want, they were like, Germany was like, we want to get the U.S. involved, we want to beat them because we want to build a world empire. Hey, I remember imperialism, the I, and mania, okay? So they asked Mexico to attack the U.S., but here's the problem. The letter got intercepted. Wham, wham, and it was written in a code. And guess what? The code was very easily deciphered. And <laughs> America sees this letter, and they're like, really? Like, really, Germany? You really want Mexico to attack us? And of course, Mexico, they don't want to fight America. We've already defeated them once in the big war. Yeah, we defeated them really badly, actually. And so uh, this is just a big, big problem. And the Zimmerman telegram is one of the real main reasons why the U.S. gets involved. And then, of course, of course, if you paid attention in the last video, you'll know, you'll, ref you'll understand these references. America always has to bring it down to this idea of we are exceptional. We are the best. We have to go over and defend democracy because we are the exceptional. This is our holy war to defend democracy. That idea of American exceptionalism, that we're the best. And of course, of course, the real reason, America really, really wants global trade to be safe because America really, really, really likes making money, okay? And we'll talk more about that here very soon. So that breaks it down for you. The reasons why America gets involved, Germany gets wild with submarines and blows up some, some ships, and I'll tell you which ones later. The Zimmerman telegram, we found this letter from Germany to Mexico, and it was like, really, Germany? You're trying to get Mexico to fight us? Really? So that we can't back down from that. It's like a threat. Then, of course, America has to show how great we are. We are the exception, and we have to go defend world democracy. And lastly, and one of the biggest things in American history that we're going to talk about all year long, America's got to take care of its money, and that's going to be a one big reason why America does get involved. So let's rock and roll. Okay, so here's the deal. During the whole early years of the war, so from 1914 to 1917, 1917 is when America joined, so from 1914 to 1917, America is sending supplies to uh, England and France. America, let me say that again. America is sending supplies to England and France, okay? Not only that, but England is blocking Germany from getting supplies from around the world, okay? So England has set up a, peri a perimeter of boats around the North Sea to stop supplies from getting to Germany, okay? I actually got ahead of myself talking about America. So England has set up a blockade, and now Germany, they send out submarines, and they're like, yeah, we're about to blow up all these ships because we need to get stuff too. You can't just cut us off. We're going to blow up your ships that are blocking us, okay? So, and Germany actually just starts to be like, you know what? Any ship that we see as an enemy, American, English, French, otherwise, we're going to blow it up. And what we call this is unrestricted, unrestricted submarine warfare. So un unrestricted just means if they, if they saw you as an enemy, if Germany saw you as an enemy, uh, they're going to blow up your ship, basically. Okay? So, here you go. You can see you got some maps and stuff. By the way, 
it would be really crazy to be on a submarine. That's just my opinion. But I just, I, those guys, they're on another level of like courageous manliness. Cause I, being under the water like that and it's such a dangerous situation. Woo, scary. All right, so you can see here how uh, England, they blocked off Germany from getting access to the North Sea. And so that's why Germany starts using submarines to blow up all these ships, okay? Now here's the deal. There was a boat, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of it. There was a boat, it's called the Lusitania, okay? This is it right here, and I'm gonna write down some words on here, okay? The Lusitania. Lusitania. The Lusitania was as big as the Titanic. In fact, it's called the Titanic's sister ship. So this is a big, big boat, okay? There's like 1,200 people on it, all right? 1,200 people. Now here's the deal. The Lusitania, it took off in 1915, and uh, you can read this if you'd like to. In 1915, this is a commercial boat. This has just regular people on it. This is not a warship, okay? So the Lusitania is not a warship. It's just carrying passengers, it's carrying cargo. Now here's the thing though. It is believed that the Lusitania did have weapons and supplies and food in the bottom level of the boat that they were sending across, okay? There were Americans on board. Uh-oh, there were Americans on board. And I believe it was about 100 Americans. Oh uh, yeah, 128 Americans. 128 Americans. And remember, Germany, like I said earlier, they don't care. If they see your boat as a threat to Germany and England is their enemy, and this comes from England, they are not happy about it. And so Germany, they see this Lusitania in the water, and they blow it up. Uh-oh. It sank in just 18 minutes, and it killed 1,198 people. Uh, crazy, 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 crazy. Um, so it's around 1,200 people that get killed. Some are Americans. Now, this happens in 1915, and America doesn't actually immediately get involved. They had warned people on this boat. They said, hey, you're sailing through the North Sea. Germany is very likely to blow y'all up, okay? So, the Lusitania sinks. Everybody sees Germany as this great big evil thing. They're like, whoa, Germany had warned everybody. But still, I mean, that doesn't, break, that doesn't make, it, um, make it okay that they did this. But still, uh, so the Lusitania sinks, all right? So what you need to know is unrestricted submarine warfare. And these German submarines were actually going all the way across the Atlantic, especially in World War II. Um, they're called untersea boats, untersea boats, U-boats, okay? So finally, um, Germany says, you know what? It doesn't matter what kind of ship you are, French, English, uh, English whatever, Russian, American boats too, we're coming after you. So uh, Americans, are they're like, you know, you know, United States government, what are y'all doing? You're letting the Germans blow up our boats. You're letting them blow them up. And I'll show you some pictures. So it finally gets to a point where America cannot avoid it anymore. And they're like, the Germans with their submarines, they're doing too much. We might have to go to war, okay? So another, one of the main reasons why the U.S. gets involved is unrestricted submarine warfare. So remember that right there, unrestricted submarine warfare. The United States is sick of Germany blowing up boats, okay? Now, here's the real reason why America gets involved. This is what breaks the back of America and says, okay, we've gotta go, we gotta go get involved in this war. So I already told you the story, but essentially, Germany writes a letter to Mexico. And remember, they can't just get on the phone and call Mexico, that's not a capability yet. So it's a telegram, all right? And it has to go, it's called the Zimmerman telegram because the foreign ambassador, his name was Zimmerman, and his last name was Zimmerman, the German guy. And they write a letter to Mexico, and it, but here's the problem. It has to go through London. It goes through enemy territory. So it goes through England, and of course, it's intercepted there because Germany is like, they're at war with England, and so England's keeping an eye on Germany, and the letter gets intercepted. It immediately gets decoded. It's written in uh, number form, and I'll show you a picture of it right here. It's written in numbers, but of course, you know, these very, very smart, important, uh, like, intelligence officials in the government, they immediately decode it, and what it basically says is it says, Mexico, we need you to attack America. And when you attack America, we're going to help you. We're going to send you money. We're going to send you soldiers. We're going to send you weapons. We're going to send you all this stuff. And when you win, we will give you all the land back that America stole from you. Okay, because that's the way they phrase it. America stole this land from you in the Mexican-American War. 
Mexico, of course, they receive the letter and they kind of are like, really? Like, we're not going to attack America. They have far superior weapons. They already whooped us in the, in the Mexican-American War. It's a big problem. No way. And of course, America looks at it and is like, really? Like, really, Germany? You're really going to do this? Um, in the letter, too, Germany also asks Japan to, to join. They also say, hey, Mexico, um, it's going to be no big deal. Japan's going to get involved, too. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to build a global empire, and you're going to get a piece of it. Okay? But mainly what you need to know is that the letter is from Germany to Mexico, and it asks Mexico to attack America in exchange for land. They're going to get all their land back if they help Germany defeat America. And America reads this and they're like, oh my gosh, really Germany? Really? And so it's a big problem. And uh, now the United States, they have no choice. They have to get involved in this war. They have to go fight Germany. Okay? Uh, I really like this cartoon uh, because it says the temptation. Okay? You can see a guy, he's dressed in an outfit that is traditionally Mexican. Okay. Uh, and then this guy, you know he's German because of one thing right here. The Germans during World War I wore these helmets that have, and they put devil horns on him. I know it's bad, you shouldn't do that. But this helmet, it's a German helmet, and the thing on top is called a pickle hopper. Um, I don't know exactly how that's spelled, but you can see it's called the Temptation. Germany offering Mexico lots of money and land back. Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Okay, uh, so the Zimmerman telegram, letter from Germany to Mexico says, Mexico, go attack America, and it's going to be great. And America's like, really? Okay. Now, of course, America can't just, you remember, you've all, in America, it's always got to have this, like, we're awesome, we're the best, we're amazing, we're wonderful, amazing people, we're wonderful, amazing Americans. So we need to go to Europe, not because of the submarine things, yeah, that's bad, but we don't care, that's not the, that's not the main reason. Yeah, Germany, they're telling this stuff, crazy stuff to Mexico, but we're going to defend democracy because democracy is the best and America is the best. And so we got to go over there and we got to keep the world safe. We got to keep democracy safe. We have to defend democracy. Now, really, what it is all about, they got attacked. And not only that, but when the whole time they're getting attacked, they're losing money, okay? Because when the ships sink, that's money gone. So here's what the real deal is. America is really wanting to protect their money. They're wanting global trade to get up and back up without the threat of German submarines. They're like, yo, submarines, man, we're just trying to make some money. And he keeps sinking us. He keeps blowing us up. Stop doing that. So America is wanting to really protect their money. And I can't say I blame them. That would be, if somebody was messing with my money, I'd probably be pretty upset with them too. So um, economic interest was another big deal. And all that is, is just protecting. America is protecting its money. It's wanting global trade to be safe so they can continue to make lots and lots of money. Okay. Now, unfortunately, they have to go to war to do that. All right. So the causes and effects of German submarine warfare. Remember the causes, England had blockaded Germany. Blockaded means they put boats out in the water and supplies couldn't get there. Causes, England blockaded Germany. So blockade means they put boats in the water and Germany couldn't get any supplies. So they send U-boats, submarines, out to go sink all the ships. And after a while, they don't care what kind of ship it is, they're blowing it up. Effects, uh, Germany began sinking all foreign ships. If you are not a German ship or coming to help Germany, we're going to sink you. Sinking all foreign ships. And it said, including the sinking of Lusitania, that, that, you could put that under there. Uh, they were a foreign ship, they were an English ship, and um, Germany blew them up, and it had Americans on it. So that makes America feel very angry towards Germany. Zimmerman Telegram. It's a letter. From Germany to Mexico, asking Mexico to attack America. And in exchange, they would get land back. Oops, to attack America in exchange for land. All right, in exchange for land. And then, no, 
number seven, how did democracy and economic motivations influence American sentiment? They are defenders of democracy. That's what America calls themselves, defenders of democracy. And they want to protect global trade because global trade means America's going to make lots of money because America at the time was making lots and lots of stuff. Remember the Gilded Age, all the factories? That's still going on, okay? So America is making lots and lots of stuff, and if they can't send it across the ocean without some German submarine blowing it up, then they can't make their money. So that's why they're wanting to go fight Germany. They're like, look, man, y'all are blowing up all of our ships, and all of our ships have all of our stuff on it, and all of our stuff is what makes us money, and we're losing money. And it's very frustrating, okay? So there you go. So let me make sure you can see this okay, and let me see how we're doing on time. Doing good, 45 minutes in. I know this is a long one, but hey, this is a huge topic. We're covering an entire World War I today. So, very good. All right, so there's uh, German uh, submarine warfare. Remember, makes the, everybody mad at them, basically. Okay, and then Germany gets real wild with the Zimmerman telegram. Kind of stupid on Germany's part. Okay, and then lastly, America, they say we are the defenders of democracy. But remember, it really kind of all goes back to money. Okay, cool. Pause it if you need to. Email me if you need to. I'm gonna give me a swig of water because I've been talking a lot. And here we go. Da, 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 da. Hope y'all having a good day. Today's a lovely day. Sunday. All right. So, last one. Key parts of World War One. Now, this is where we get to talk about the cool stuff. The actual war. Um, and the war is very, very bloody. It's very, very bad. Remember I told you, it's kind of like a medieval war. Um, they're fighting a lot of hand-to-hand, -hand, but the problem is they have really, really good weapons now. So they're, they're just like slaughtering each other. Very, very bad time. Um, if you've seen the movie, and I really wish we could watch it at school. Unfortunately, it is rated R. So if you don't condone rated R, excuse me for saying this, but the movie 1917, um, it's a perfect depiction of what World War I life in the trenches was like. It's a great movie. It is rated R, so I'm not going to say watch it um, because y'all aren't old enough. You need to be 18 to watch it. Um, but it is a great movie, um, and it depicts life perfectly in the trenches. Uh, maybe watch a trailer or something, and you can you can get an idea. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to talk. Let's just go ahead and talk about it. Uh, the war was fought mainly in trenches because they had not yet figured out. Huh, maybe we shouldn't get together. So like medieval warfare, you know, remember the guys would just stand out in the field and attack each other. They had this same idea during World War I because they had not advanced enough in their thinking to realize, oh wait, I have a machine gun that can shoot 100 rounds a minute. Maybe I shouldn't go fight in an open field. And so what they figure out is say, hey, we need to dig these trenches to defend ourselves. And so they dig these holes that are six feet down in the ground and they just have to fight through that way. They have to go over the top, that's what that's called. That's when you come up out of the trenches and you run across this open land called no man's land because as soon as these guys popped up out of the trenches, they would immediately get shot, okay, because machine guns and new artillery. Artillery is these giant guns that throw huge bombs, they shoot huge bombs into the other trench. So going over the top, that means you come out and you run across this open field called no man's land. There'd be barbed wire, there'd be dead bodies, all kinds of nastiness out in that no man's land. And when you went over the top, it's pretty much guaranteed you're gonna die. Um, now, life in the actual trench, and I have some pictures. Life in the actual trench was really, really bad uh, because it would flood in there. Obviously, it's a hole in the ground. You're literally living in a hole in the ground. There you go. And um, so disease, rats, um, just general filth, a lot of these guys, they would have wet feet for just days and days on end and their skin would rot off and a lot of people actually had to have their feet amputated. Sometimes that would even turn into a disease like in their blood and they would die from this. So this is just really, really bad. Also, obviously you can't like go out and leave and use the bathroom. So they're using the bathroom in the trenches. Just really, really bad situation. Um, this is a modern day field in France that, where the trenches have been filled up, but you can see, you know, they're still kind of there. And these things were actually really, really complicated uh, the way they were built, and they got pretty fancy with them. Um, because of this, we get all kinds of new ideas and new weapons, uh, such as, like, you see the scope. He's got a periscope on his rifle that he's put on there. 
Um, they used to build fake trees. They would build, they, like, like, basically like an artist would sculpt a fake tree and they would stand the tree up and then guys would climb up inside the tree and then they could look out holes in the tree and see what the enemy's doing. Um, and obviously airplanes are gonna become a big deal during this time. I think airplanes were invented like 1908, something like that. Obviously they're not great yet. They're not the best flying machines. Uh, but they started to figure out that they could drop bombs in these things from, from airplanes. So um, we're getting to a very complicated style of fighting with an old school mindset of, oh, well, let's just go out in the field and shoot at each other. And they realized, wait, this is not good. We're going to immediately die. We need to dig these holes, these trenches. And any kind of progress that was made, they would just have to fight for it, literally. And then the next day, they, it would pretty much get shot back and they'd have to go back to their old trench. So it's, it's just a terrible long war lasts for four years, really, really bad, and like I told you, over 10 million people got killed just in the war alone. Now, like I told you, it's a modern war, so you got all kinds of new weapons. Machine guns, that's the main thing that's new. They figured out they can make guns, because if you remember in the 1800s in the Civil War, they had muskets, and muskets you could get off the fastest guy could shoot about two shots per minute. Two shots per minute is really not that much compared to a machine gun, which can shoot 100 rounds or more per minute, okay? So this is gonna be a very, very bloody war. They've also figured out how to make flamethrowers. Uh, poison gas is gonna be a big deal, mortars. And because of all this, you're gonna have a lot of like mental health issues that come about because of the war, like PTSD becomes a thing. They call it shell shock, because these weapons are so good, but the men, they've never seen this kind of stuff before, so it's completely terrifying to them, okay? Um, so let's see some more pictures. Tanks are another thing, okay, again, and here's a machine gun. Um, they're wearing gas masks because gas attacks were very, very common. They would use mustard gas and chlorine gas, which just like melts your eyeballs, melts your skin in your face, really, really gruesome stuff. Um, blimps were another thing. These blimps would fly over cities and drop bombs. Now here's the problem with a blimp. If you shoot it, it explodes because it's full of helium or hydrogen one, I'm not sure. I'm not a blimp expert. But anyway, it's full of gas. That's what keeps it afloat. And when you shoot it, it explodes in the flame. Very terrible. And also, of course, flamethrowers. Um, the tanks in the beginning were terrible. They didn't really work that good and they would break down a lot. Um, but they were effective, the ones that would run. They were very effective because obviously you're not gonna be able to shoot through this thing and it's got big guns mounted on the side too, okay? Um, so artillery was big. It's these big cannons that shoot out giant guns. Airplanes, like I told you. Now, one of the crazy weapons of World War I is they, and it's really actually an old kind of weapon, is they created these darts. It was like a metal dart, D-A-R-T, like a dart, like you throw like this. And um, so it would be like about like this big and it would have like a very sharp tip on it and it would have a feather attached to the back. And this guy flying in this plane would drop these darts from the sky. He would fly over the enemy, and they would all be lined up, of course, in the trenches. So he knew where his target was. And he would drop these darts from the sky from his airplane. And he could drop, you know, a hundred of them, a thousand of them, however many. They would fly silently, because it's not anything mechanical. It's just a big metal dart with a sharp point on the end. And it would pierce through the top of these guys' helmets and, and get into their skull, uh, pierce their brain. So World War I is a disgusting war as far as the weapons and the murder and the killing. It's just, it's really, really bad, okay? Poison gas they used, like I told you, it would blind them. Uh, you can see even the donkey or the horse. That looks like a donkey. He has a gas mask, but it doesn't cover his eyes, so that would be terrible. So just a really, really gruesome war, okay? All right. Now, there are a few her heroes and heroic groups of people who emerge out of this war. And the first group of guys that you need to know, they're called the Harlem Hellfighters. Harlem Hellfighters. And Harlem ref uh, references Harlem, New York. And historically, Harlem in New York City is a mostly black neighborhood, an African-American, predominantly African-American neighborhood, okay? And uh, these guys, the Harlem Hellfighters, they were segregated. They were drafted for the war, but they were segregated. They were an all-black regiment, and these guys spent more time in combat than any other group, more time than any white Americans, even though at home, these guys have no rights, basically, okay? They're discriminated against. Remember, America was super racist at the time, and of course, what they do with these guys, this all-black regiment, they send them straight to the front lines, because they don't care about them. But these guys, they say, hey, you know what? You're gonna do this to us? Let's make the most of it. So they become the Hellfighters, 
And what that means is that these guys, you didn't want to mess with these guys, okay? Um, several of them, uh, I believe, were awarded the Medal of Honor. I don't think it says anything on there about it. But um, these were some hardcore fighters. There's stories of them uh, where it's like two or three guys facing like 100 men, and they survive and kill like 42 guys each. There's a YouTube video about it. I'd really like to show you a YouTube video, but I don't know what the, like, if that's like me stealing somebody's YouTube video. I don't know. But anyway, so I would recommend, I would highly recommend looking these guys up on YouTube because there's some great, more information about them. But just know, this is a bad group of dudes. You don't want to mess with these guys. And I say bad, like hardcore fighters. They um, were won great victories, and they, be, they basically became legends in the U.S. military, okay? And they're called the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, mostly African-American, or excuse me, all African-American infantry. And even though they faced racism at home, they were sent to fight for their country, and they did a really, really good job, okay? These are heroes of World War I, all right? Heroes of World War I, the Harlem Hellfighters. All right, Herbert Hoover, who he was at the time, he worked for the government, he wasn't president yet, he'll become president later, and he was not a good president, unfortunately. Um, but he gets a special assignment, he's, um, he's a politician during World War I, and he heads up something called the American Food Administration. And what they do is they gather up a bunch of food from America and they ship it over to uh, Europe and help out war victims. Because remember, this war is basically being fought in Europeans' backyard, okay? A lot of uh, refugees and a lot of people starving to death. It's a very, very bad situation. These people are just getting kicked out of their homes because it's a war zone. Um, and so Herbert Hoover, he heads up something called the American Food Administration. And notice it says they, they sent over 2 million tons of food to 9 million war victims. So that's really good. Herbert Hoover sends, uh, he's American Food Administration, sends over tons and tons of food to help win the war. He helps out all these war victims, okay? All right, now, leading up to World War I, America did not have a strong army. America had a very strong navy, okay, but not a strong army. And in fact, our army was mostly, it existed, but not too much, okay? It was, there, wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot going on with it. So uh, the American government, when we get in this war, they realize, hey, we gotta figure out a force that we can send over. We gotta train people to go fight this war. All we've got is a strong navy. We don't have much of an army. So they, they recruit this guy, his name is John J. Pershing, and he creates something called the American Expeditionary Force. American Expeditionary Force. And all that is, it's a fancy name for the army, okay? It's troops on the ground, all right? And John J. Pershing, he trains these guys. They train uh, in America, and then they go over to Europe, and they win a fantastic victory. And it's it, one of the cool stories about this is a lot of these guys came straight out of the factories. They were like, hey, I feel the calling. I need to go serve my country. I've been working, you know, I'm just working in a factory, just doing normal American stuff. I want to do something greater than that. I want to be something better. And so they go to fight for John J. Pershing and his American Expeditionary Force. And the Americans win a great victory. Um, we joined the war in 1917, and the war is over in, by November of 1918 because of America's help, okay? All right, and a war hero that you need to remember, and he's very, very cool because he is from Tennessee. He's from a place called Paul Mall, Tennessee. Paul Mall, Tennessee. Okay, which is near Jamestown, Tennessee. Um, he is basically a country boy, and he's also what we call a pacifist. Uh, Alvin C. York is someone who says, I don't want to fight. He was a big time Christian, strong believer in Christian values in the Bible, and he was worried if he fought that he wouldn't get to go to heaven. He said, if I kill someone, I won't get to go to heaven, etc. Well, somebody in the army said, you know what, Alvin York, don't worry about that. Um, because it's your duty, because it's your job, you can go fight. Well, it turns out it's pretty good that Alvin C. York went to fight because one day during the war, um, he was leading an attack and uh, he himself, by himself, he killed at least 25 enemy soldiers and by himself and I think like five other guys, they captured 130 German soldiers, okay? Um, so he becomes a big time war hero. Uh, he came back to Tennessee and he traveled all over America giving speeches about his thing. But what you need to remember about him is he's, he's from Tennessee and he won the Medal of Honor during World War I. It's kind of Tennessee's claim to fame with World War I. So good job, Alvin York. Good job winning the Medal of Honor. Good job. 
he was a turkey hunter. And when they asked him about like how he did this, he was like, well, I just picked them off like turkeys. I uh, started at the back, shot the one in the back, then I worked my way forward. Um, so he was very good at his job, okay? Even though he didn't even want to do it. He's a pacifist, okay? All right. Ah, uh -huh. and we are ready. And I think I spelled pacifist wrong, but oh well. All right, describe trench warfare, including life in the trenches. Uh, so here's what I'll do. I'll just, I'll write it like this, make it easy. Life in the trenches is terrible. Because remember, they would flood. It's dirty and diseased. Dirty, disease. Remember, diseases are really common when you're living in water. <laughs> Going over the top means coming out of the trench to attack. And the problem with that is the enemy has their machine guns aimed at you and you're basically pretty much guaranteed to get killed. So going over the top means coming out of the trench to attack. No man's land is the space between the trenches. Space between the enemy's trench and your trench. Space between trenches. And it's called no man's land because that's where people got killed. All right? New weapons of World War I, we've got a bunch of them. I'm just going to list a few. Machine guns, obviously, is the most important. Airplanes play a big role. Tanks play a big role. Poison gas plays a big role. Poison gas. Um, and let's list flamethrowers, because everybody likes flamethrowers. Harlem Hellfighter, Harlem Hellfighters, excuse me. They are an all African American infantry unit. They were heroes of World War One. Fierce fighters. That's why they get this name, Harlem Hellfighters. They're fierce. Uh, the enemy knew about them. They even called them the Harlem Hellfighters. So yeah, big deal. Very cool. Okay, pause it if you need to. Email me if you need to. And I think this is the last one. Yep. Um, so here we go. Last one. Herbert Hoover's role during World War I. Leader of American Food Administration. American Food Administration. And what they did sent food to war victims. To war victims. Okay. John J. Pershing's role, leader of American Expeditionary Force, which is like the Army. Fancy name for them. York, Tennessean, who won the Medal of Honor. The highest award given by the military. Very good. All right. So, next time we will talk about the end of World War I and what happens from there. And, um, yeah, so I think you got it all. Hope you remember the causes of World War I. Remember Mania. Uh, if you remember, uh, the assassination is kind of what really got the war going. Um, and then if you recall why the United States got involved, because of submarine warfare and because of uh, the Zimmerman telegram. Uh, remember, we were also defending democracy and protecting our economic interests. Remember, the war had, the main feature of the war was fighting in trenches and there were all kinds of new weapons. Then we had the Harlem Hellfighters who were a group of uh, all African Americans who were heroes of the war. Uh, then, of course, you've got these guys, okay? Guys, email me if you need anything. Download this PowerPoint if you need it from my website. Uh, please let me know if you need any help. Hopefully you enjoyed learning about World War I. I highly recommend looking at some other videos and stuff. There's a lot of great stuff out there on YouTube about World War I. Um, I just hopefully gave you a taste of that. And uh, yeah, I would highly suggest reading, looking into it more if you're interested. Email me if you need anything. Download the stuff if you need it. Um, and I hope you have an excellent day. Bye!